you grew up in Rhode Island. T- tell me kind of the things you remember growing up in Bristol and what kind of things formed your young mind that yeah. have now translated to today. Well, when you grow up in Bristol, um, you learn the importance of public service from a young age. You know, Bristol is the most patriotic town in the country, of course. We're very proud of that. And uh, every year, not just on the 4th of July, but all through the season, as a town, we would find ways to honor people who have served in the military, law enforcement, firefighters, uh, people who are just good community servants in the community. And so you learn from a young age growing up in Bristol that uh, your real worth in life is uh, how much you give back. And that's something that I've always carried with me. Uh, I've only missed four Bristol Fourth of July parades in my life. All four of them killed me every time that I couldn't be there. And, uh, you know, it's a place that um, I'm proud to be from. It was very formative for me. Do you have the same spot that you sit in at the parade, or, or do you move? Or do you, are you one, were you one of those people you got to be out there with, with the chair and stick on we, your spot? We, we've mixed it up through the years. We I used to go out at 5 a.m. every day. I don't do that anymore now that I'm in the parade. But um, uh, but my sister, uh, who's a 30 year old doctor, she still is out at 5 a.m. every year. Yeah. <laughs> um, j- just tell me about your parents. I know a lot of people know you, you know your yeah. dad worked for Bill Clinton. I mean, did you ever remember anything? I mean, you were old enough at that time to remember. Did you ever? Yeah. Get to meet cool people and. Yeah, I mean, what I remember the most is we had a lot of really good dinner table conversations when I was a kid about policy and about how government can help people. So when my dad was in the Clinton administration. The biggest thing that he worked on, <laughs> should we start that over? <laughs> uh, so, uh, okay. so um, the thing that I remember the most growing up is we would have great dinner table conversations when I was a kid um, about ways that government and policy can help make people's lives better. Um, when my father was in the Clinton administration, the biggest thing that he worked on was health care reform. Uh, he worked to try to pass uh, legislation to make health care more affordable, available to more people. And although that bill didn't pass, uh, it helped lay the groundwork for what later became the Affordable Care Act under President Obama. And so from the time I was 9 or 10 years old, I remember really in-depth dinner table conversations about what we could be doing to lower the cost of prescription drugs, what we could be lowering to expand access to health care, to lower health insurance premiums, like very wonky stuff for a nine-year-old to be, you know, talking about at dinner. But those are the kinds of conversations we had, and those are still some of the things that motivate me today. I want to finish that work of expanding access to health care, making it easier for working people to get ahead, raising wages for working people. These are the things that we literally talked about at the dinner table when I was a kid, and it's what I've been passionate about ever since. Were you guys down in D.C. at that point, or was your dad basically here? Both. Uh, he was in D.C. Uh, with President Clinton for five years, um, but you know, I was born and raised in Bristol. Rhode Island is where I've spent virtually my entire life, um, and uh, very proud to be a Rhode Islander. Uh, and as you went to high school, you went to Milton and then to Brown. Um, just tell me if there's any experiences there that you know kind of stuck out. Is this is public service what you always you know getting getting into politics? Is that what you always yeah. thought you were going to do, or, or not? Did you... No, not necessarily. So um, the biggest thing that I got involved in politically in college was uh, the campaign for marriage equality in Rhode Island. So I organized students. Uh, uh, at the college level to go to the state house to lobby our legislators and it was a great experience um, because we were fighting for something we believed in we we didn't believe that uh, gay or lesbian Rhode Islanders shouldn't be able to marry who they love and be treated equally uh, but also because it showed one of the great things about Rhode Island which is how accessible government can be that you could show up at the state house and meet the state senators meet the state representatives lobby them make your point of view heard and ultimately, of course, we were successful in passing that marriage equality bill. So that was very formative for me. Um, I didn't know that I wanted to go into politics, though. I knew I wanted to do some sort of public service. And so after college, I started out my career as a teacher. Um, I uh, moved down to Louisiana, where Hurricane Katrina had just uh, struck, and got a job teaching third and fourth grade as a public school teacher. And it was really that experience that made me think that I might want to run for office one day. I was teaching in a school district that was low income, that had a lot of challenges. Our school building was falling apart. Uh, We didn't have the resources that we as teachers felt that we needed in order to do our jobs well. And my students were going through a lot. Uh, 
a lot of them, third and fourth grade, they went home to empty houses at the end of the school day because their parents were working two or three jobs uh, in order to get by. And uh, we didn't know it at the time, but those were the early months and years leading up to the Great Recession. And so what was already a very depressed area economically uh, uh, lost a lot of jobs, lost a lot of business. And it was that experience that made me think that maybe someday I would run for office because I want to be able to shape policy to help make it easier for working families like those whose kids I was teaching uh, to get ahead. Yeah, so you ended up in Louisiana. Was that, as you were doing... Uh, Teach for America. Yeah. So, did they place you there, or is that like somewhere? Like, how, I guess, how'd you end up in, in Louisiana? Yeah. So, the way it worked back then is um, you had to rank which locations you were interested in going in, and it just turned out that Louisiana was my first choice. Um, there wasn't a Rhode Island location in the program at that time. There is now, um, and you know, I wanted to try something different, get to a different part of the country. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, it was literally months after uh, Katrina hit, and. Uh, it seemed like a place that needed some help, and so I wanted to go down there and, and do my part to pitch in. Um, and, and so after that, you went into the financial sector. I guess what what led to that decision and, and yeah. that point in your life? So when I was in Louisiana teaching, uh, I was in a small town, an economically depressed community, and I remember the one restaurant in town that had tablecloths went out of business, and then a few months later, the Home Depot went out of business, and... We didn't know it at the time, but it was the beginning of the Great Recession. And it just struck me that there were decisions being made in corporate boardrooms a thousand miles away that were impacting the lives of my students and their families. And the people making those decisions in those boardrooms probably weren't spending a lot of time thinking about communities like the one I was working in as a teacher. And certainly those of us who were living and working in those communities didn't understand what was going into those decisions in those boardrooms. So. I decided to go and get uh, a master's in business degree and spend some time working in the financial sector because I wanted to understand how the financial world worked so that we could try to do something to make it work better for working people. Well, I bet the wagon was making another pass here. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, all right, and then so you go from that and, and, then, and then you run for office. Um, so you've been thinking about it. What was that like? What went into the decision? Why treasurer? Yeah. Um, and, and what was that experience? Yeah. Has it been for you? So I had moved back to Rhode Island. I was living in Providence and taking the train to Boston, um, working for a socially responsible investment firm. And I started getting involved in different things on the side. I was uh, a volunteer for Common Cause of Rhode Island, organizing for better government and ethics in Rhode Island. And... Uh, also got back involved with the marriage equality campaign. That was when we finally got the law passed to uh, give equal rights to same-sex couples. And when I saw the treasurer's office open up, I thought, okay, well, here's an opportunity for me to use my financial background and also my experience as a former public school teacher in a low-income community uh, to try to do some good for Rhode Island. And I thought that there were things that we could do from the treasurer's office to help make it easier for working people to get ahead. And, and we've done it. Uh, eight years later, I can look back at my time as state treasurer and know that working with a great team, we got a lot of really good things done. We passed a historic state school construction program that has put more than 20,000 people to work fixing school buildings all across Rhode Island. We've invested in clean energy. We divested from companies that manufactured assault weapons. And we managed the state retirement fund to an all-time high to make retirement security stronger for the state's teachers and first responders and other public employees. And so. Um, you know, uh, eight years ago, I wanted to run for treasurer because I thought we could do things to help people, and I can look back and say that we have. Um, so, you know, one of the knocks on you from you know, in the commercials, the, yeah. the the pack commercials, is is your background and, and how much wealth your family has, and you know, you went to good schools and stuff like that. Does, does that bother you that that's brought up as as a negative thing? Do you feel that? it's not an issue or, or when people, you know, and it comes yeah. up in politics all the time, it's with people's backgrounds. Yeah. Does that does that bother you that, that, that that's an issue? Well, I think that what defines us in life is not how we were born because none of us have any control over that, whether we're born rich, poor, black, white, blue. Um, we can't control it. But what we can control is what we choose to fight for. And I have spent my entire life fighting 
to make life easier for working people. Uh, starting out as a public school teacher, my work organizing for marriage equality and other causes that I believed in, as state treasurer where we launched the school construction program that put 20,000 people to work, and now running for Congress where I'm running to lower drug prices, protect Social Security and Medicare, crack down on the oil companies that are price gouging working people. Um, what defines us is what we fight for. I've always been on the side of fighting for working people. And not everyone in politics chooses that path. There are some people in politics who choose to side with the powerful instead of with working people. You know, there are those who choose to side with the big oil companies and the big drug companies and take their money to fund their campaigns. Uh, that's never interested me. Uh, I've always chosen the path of standing up for workers, fighting for better wages, better benefits, better workplace protections, and that's what motivates me. Uh, also, rewind, so at Brown, you met your wife? Yeah. Is that correct? So now you're, I, I'll say new dad, not so much new. It's been a year, so that's like an eternity, I assume. How yeah. is, uh, how, how does your wife shape your views on, I'll start with it. How does your wife shape your views on things, and you bounce things off her, and does yeah. she think all this stuff is crazy? Well, I, I feel very lucky to have met Julia. Um, you know, we've got a great partnership. I'm very proud of her and very grateful for how supportive she's been of me. Um, uh, politics is not easy on families. Uh, we put a lot of time and effort into serving the people, and uh, it's certainly not fun when there's negative ads flying and all of the other nonsense. But Julia understands, as I do, that uh, we are in this not for us, but to help other people, to make it easier for working people in Rhode Island to get ahead. Um, one of the things that we have in common is that, you know, our families uh, wouldn't be in the position that we're in if it were not for government policies that helped working people. My grandparents all grew up poor, but they were able to buy houses with help from the GI Bill. They were able to retire with dignity uh, because of Social Security and Medicare. And Julia's family, similarly, she grew up in Pittsburgh. She comes from a family of boilermakers. And, uh, it was only because of programs like Social Security and Medicare, great public schools, that her family you know, was able to build a stable life for her and her siblings. So we share a similar passion for trying to make life easier for working people and having government that reflects good values. Uh, and as I mentioned, you have a now one-year-old. Did yeah. that fly by? Did it, has it gone really <laughs> slow? Uh, how has that changed your perspective, if it has at yeah. all? Or, or is it to just make you more tired? It now, it's been so much fun. We, lo we love being parents. I love being a dad. Um, Max is one year old now. He is a lot of fun. He is very high energy. Um, but when you're a parent, there are certain things that hit you in different ways. Um, every time there's a new school shooting, it's a punch to the gut. I want Max to be able to go to school and not have to worry about lockdown drills and school shootings. I want him to be able to vote in an election and make sure that our democracy survives for the next generation uh, because I do think that our democracy is under threat right now. And, you know, having a, um, having a child, I do think, makes you appreciate how the decisions that people in positions of authority really impact uh, the quality of life for families. and. Uh, it just motivates me even more to work hard to try to help people across Rhode Island. Uh, so we're here at the playground now, and you have a one-year-old, so, and you're running for office, so I'm guessing you don't have a lot of free time, but what, yeah. what do you, maybe before you're running for office, uh, for this office or not, what, what do you do, who is Seth Magaziner <laughs> on the, when he's yeah. not political Seth Magaziner? Well, now he's a dad, <laughs> and so um, uh, I take Max to swim lessons every week. That's uh, that's part of our bonding time. Uh, it's the ocean state, so you know we want to make sure that he gets comfortable with the water from a young age. And it's, it's good bonding time for the two of us. So uh, I try to protect that time and do that every week, no matter what we have going on with the campaign or in my day job as state treasurer. Um, and uh, other than that, before I was a dad, uh, I'm a big Boston Celtics fan. I watch almost every game, uh, at least on, uh, on you know, repeat or something like that if, uh, if I don't get a chance to watch it live. Uh, so I'm, I have high hopes for this season, and it's especially exciting to see a Rhode Islander from the 2nd Congressional District as our new head coach. Um, but no, I mean, right now we're, we're locked in and we're focused on making sure that we not only win in November, but get some real things done in Congress to make it easier for working people in Rhode Island to get ahead.
Do you, do you get a chance? Do you binge watch anything? You watch anything on TV besides Celtics games? <laughs> no, I don't. I, I I do not have I do not have a lot of time for that. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Any uh, any books that you like or have stuck with you through the years? Oh gosh, yeah. I um. I tend to be particularly inspired by people who find ways to persevere despite tough odds, and so. Uh, lately, I've been reading some Abraham Lincoln biographies. He's someone who, through the course of his career, before he became the president that we all remember, went through uh, a number of setbacks, both personal and professional. And so uh, I find that inspiring. And uh, I, I love any book that is set in Rhode Island. So there's a lot of good murder mysteries that have come out lately that are set in Rhode Island. Um, you know, there's... Um, some authors like Vanessa Lilly and Caroline Kepnes and uh, Bruce De Silva that write like good Rhode Island murder mystery type books um, that are set locally. So those are always a lot of fun too. Okay. Those are my beach reads. <laughs> All right. Uh, anything else you want to add? Any favorite spots around the state that, yeah. that you really like? Um, so no, I mean my favorite spot is uh, you know next to that guy uh, with Max. Um, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, you know we we do a lot of hiking uh, when we have time and um, uh, get out on bike paths with him, and that's been a lot of fun. But uh, no, I mean look, I'm I'm in this race because families in Rhode Island who are working hard and willing to do the right thing ought to have a chance to build a good life for themselves and a better life for their kids. Um, that's the story of my family, and as I talk to Rhode Islanders, what I hear is that that's getting harder for people, that people are working hard, but they're not able to keep up with their bills, and they're worried about the future, and they need leaders in Washington who are willing to do the tough things, like crack down on the oil companies and the drug companies, protect programs like Social Security and Medicare, and build a better future for the next generation. And that's why we're in this. Actually, I do want to circle back on one thing. Um, do you have any any regrets over doing I, I'm guessing yeah. I'll know your answer. Do you have any regrets over going to this race versus the governor's race, especially looking at the landscape there? No, absolutely not. I mean, I got into the race for Congress because, number one, I thought it was the place where I could do the most to help working people in Rhode Island, make health care more affordable, crack down on oil prices, protect programs like Social Security and Medicare. This is where I can make the most difference. And I also got into this race because I do worry about the future of our country. Politics in Washington has become toxic, and I do not want election deniers taking control of the House of Representatives. There were over 100 Republicans in Congress who voted to overturn the will of the people in the last election, and we cannot let those same people who tried to overturn the election take control of the House of Representatives going into the next presidential election cycle. And so I want to be able to, when Max, my son, is is older, I want to be able to tell him that I did everything that I could at this moment to help preserve our democracy and to help make uh, our government work better for people. And that's why I'm in this race, and that's what I'm looking forward to do uh, when we win 12 days from now.